Welcome to It's Your Choice. On today's episode, we'll talk about estimating the likelihood of outcomes so you can be better at managing uncertainty in your decisions. We'll also cover some common traps and give you tips on how to avoid them. Hey, Roger. You ready to talk some more about decision trees? Yeah, we really need to after last time when we talked about my friend Amy and the shoplifter. Even though she didn't have much time to think through her decision, it seems like a good example for us to keep working with. It is a good example because it's a tough one. In situations like Amy's, there's a lot of uncertainty about what will happen as a result of whatever action you take. And to help decide, it makes sense to assign probabilities to things you cannot control. Hmm. Then before we dig in, I think we should cover some basic rules of probability. Sounds good. Take it away, Roger. Rule number one, any alternative could have a number of possible outcomes. Some of those outcomes may be more likely than others. So the probability of any given outcome must be between zero and 100%. And the sum of all possible outcomes for a given alternative must add up to 100%. Hey, isn't that related to the possibility space we talked about earlier? Good call, Nicole. It's the same thing. Rule number two. There are two kinds of events that cause an outcome. Independent, independent. Right. Two events are independent if one does not affect the outcome of the other. Dependent events are when one event does affect the outcome of the next. It's just like flipping a coin. You know that the probability of getting heads is one in two, or 50%. So what's the probability of getting tails if you flip it again? Still one and two. The two events are separate and don't affect each other. Okay, but what if, by some small chance, you flipped 20 heads in a row? You know it's very unlikely to get 21 straight heads, so isn't it better to guess that tails will come up next? Uh Aha, you just fell into a trap, Nicole. Ugh, what'd I do now? This is one of the most common traps around. It's called the gambler's fallacy. It happens when you think that two independent events may actually be dependent. You thought the first 20 flips of a coin would change the likelihood of the 21st flip, but actually, the odds haven't changed. Are you sure? Think about it. The coin doesn't care that it just came up heads 20 times in a row. People get messed up on this because they somehow think the coin is keeping score. Now that we know some of the rules, Let's estimate the likelihood of the outcomes we came up with last time for Amy's decision about the shoplifter. Here are the alternatives. Amy confronts him, Amy tells someone, and Amy does nothing. So let's both fill in the chart with probabilities for each outcome. Remember the total probabilities for each alternative should add up to 100%. But what if something else happens that we didn't even imagine? Good point. We haven't thought of all the possible outcomes, and we should acknowledge that. For this example, let's just say for each alternative, there's a 5% chance that something unforeseen happens. Yeah, this is a great way to acknowledge the possibility space. Viewers, add your estimates in the chart, then we'll reveal our answers. What'd you write, Roger? For the first alternative, Amy confronts him. I think there's a 65% chance that he'll run away a 20% chance that he'll hurt her, and a 10% chance that he confesses and returns the item. Do you really think that would happen? Well, I think he's most likely to run away because that's clearly his intention. Thing is, there's a chance he'll react by turning on her, but I think that's less likely than him running away. He may also return the item, but that seems the most unlikely to me, so I gave it a low value. But where'd the numbers come from? How'd you calculate 65% exactly for him running away? Well, I didn't calculate it exactly. I didn't even mention numbers in my explanation. I basically ranked them mentally first and then gave them numbers based on my own estimates of how likely they seemed relative to each other. That sounds like a pretty useful tool. So what were your estimates, Nicole? I wrote that there's a 74% chance that he runs away, a 6% chance that he hurts her, and a 15% chance that he confesses and returns the item. Ugh, I really think she has a higher chance of getting hurt than that. But estimates are subjective, so it's okay that we have different answers. What were your probabilities of the outcomes associated with Amy telling someone like her parents, the clerk, or the police? I think there's a 45% chance he gets away, a 35% chance he gives the item back, 
a 10% chance that someone gets hurt, and a 5% chance that she gets a reward. Why did you increase the chances of him confessing this time? For alternative one, you gave that outcome only a 10% likelihood. Because now there's a person of authority calling him out. I'm not saying I'm right. It's just my own estimate based on the information. I'm only asking because I kept the likelihood of that outcome the same for alternative one and two. That's fine. What were your other estimates? I think there's a 28% chance he gets away, a 15% chance he gives the item back, a 3% chance that someone gets hurt, and a 49% chance that she gets a reward. Whoa. That's a pretty high estimate for her getting a reward. It's way higher than mine. Well, I think that'd be the right thing to do. And I think people who do the right thing should be rewarded. If I were in her shoes, I'd want that to be the outcome. But do you really think it's that likely to happen? Well, not really. But it should. Uh-oh. I think I detect a decision trap. You're confusing what you want to happen with how likely you really think it is. Again? Yeah, but this time, it's one we're familiar with. Wishful thinking. In terms of probabilities, it's when you overestimate the likelihood of a certain outcome just because you want it to happen. Think about it. What are all the events that would have to happen in order for Amy to get a reward? Well, she'd have to tell someone who's willing to listen and believes her. Um, maybe the perp would have to be caught? And the manager would have to believe it's worth rewarding her. And those are just some of the events that would have to occur, and they're not all that likely. Now let's think about what would have to happen in order for him to get away. Um, I guess nothing, really. If no one stopped him, it's pretty likely he'd escape scot-free. And you gave that outcome a lower probability than the reward one? Oops. I guess that doesn't make much sense. Yep. I got you to think in reverse about what would have to happen in order for a certain outcome to occur. I learned this in a business class. It's called backcasting. It's a way of envisioning the future to identify the steps that would have to happen to make that outcome possible. Makes total sense. A bunch of things would have to occur for Amy to get a reward compared to basically nothing for him to get away. So the reward should be given a lower estimate. Now you're thinking probabilistically. Today on It's Your Choice, Nicole and Roger introduced some basic probability concepts like independent and dependent events. They discussed the gambler's fallacy and wishful thinking, which are common traps when estimating probabilities. They also introduced some useful tools like ranking and backcasting to help with the process. Reviewing this stuff reminds me that I have a test in my marketing class tomorrow, and I haven't studied it all yet. So what's the likelihood that you'll pass? And that's my cue. See you next time on It's, it's Your, Your Choice. Choice.